Good afternoon. How are we? We all right? Okay. Well, it is good to, to be here, to be able to share God's word with you today. We have considered the church as the body of Christ. So Pastor James White helped us to think through that last night. Uh, Dr. Aiken led us through considering the church as the temple of God. And then this morning, Pastor D.A. Horton, he helped us reflect on the church as branches connected to the vine. Now, each one of these images in Scripture in different ways are pointing to the same central truth. And that truth is the glorious reality of the believer's union with Jesus Christ. Every good thing that we receive from God is rooted in our union with Christ. Somebody say union with Christ. Say union with Christ. Yeah, union with Christ. I, I cannot overstate the importance of this doctrine. It's a central theme throughout the New Testament, and it's so important that it's referenced in many different ways. In fact, the Bible not only uses illustrations, but it describes each aspect of our salvation in these terms. So, the believer is chosen in Christ, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. The believer is made alive in Christ, Ephesians 2, 5. Christians are new creations in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. We are adopted in Christ, Galatians 3, 26. We are crucified with Christ, Galatians 2, 20. We're buried with Christ, Colossians 2, 2.12. We're seated with Christ in the heavenly places, Ephesians 2.6. We're justified in Christ, Romans 8.1. We're sanctified in Christ, 1 Corinthians 1.2. And we will be glorified with Christ, Romans 8.17. Our whole salvation biblically is seen in light of this reality of our spiritual union with Christ. When we think about what baptism is, baptism is a visual picture of our union with Christ. So we're baptized into Christ, that is, we're identified with Christ in his death, Romans 6.3. And then we're also united with Christ in his resurrection, Romans 6.5. When we think about the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Supper is a tangible experience that points to our union with Christ as we eat the bread, which represents Jesus' body, and drink the cup, which represents his blood. This is why Ephesians 1.3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Every blessing that we receive comes as a result of our union with Jesus Christ. And so this is what we have been reflecting on. The church is the body of Christ. Christ is the head. That's a deeply personal union. The church is the temple of God. Christ is the cornerstone. That's a, a union of worship where we bow our knees in worship before the cornerstone. The church are the branches. Christ is the vine. That is a life-giving union. We receive life as branches from the vine. And in this message today, I have the privilege of speaking on the church as the bride of Christ with Christ as the husband. And this is a union of deep covenantal love. And so we're going to be looking at the book of Revelation. I want to encourage you, if you have your Bibles, to turn to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation 19 And I'm going to read verses 6 through 9. Revelation 19, beginning at 
verse 6. At the end of the reading, I will say this is God's word, and if you agree that this is God's word, I want to encourage you to respond, thanks be to God. Revelation 19, beginning at verse 6. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your word, which is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And so, Father, we pray that you would teach us this afternoon from your word, that we might gain a greater appreciation of what it means for the church to be the bride of Christ, for Christ to be our husband. And Lord, we pray that in this time, the Spirit of God would use the Word of God to reveal the Son of God. And we pray that you would do this for the glory of your beautiful name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So we're in the book of Revelation. Why is it called Revelation? Well, the very first verse of chapter 1, we learn that this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John. So the apostle John, one of the 12 disciples and one of the three disciples in Jesus' inner circle, has the privilege of being shown the revelation of Jesus Christ. And what we find as we read the book of Revelation is that God is revealing his purposes in history through a series of visions. And the intent of the book, like the intent of many books in the New Testament, is to comfort the people of God who are in a state of affliction. And so in chapter 1, verse 9, the Apostle John refers to himself as your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus. And so this book is meant to help believers patiently endure tribulation. And our text today finds us at the end of the age. It is what theologians refer to as the consummation. So you have creation, you have the fall, you have redemption, and then you have consummation, the culmination of all the things that God has been doing in redemptive history. Now, there's all kinds of disagreements among Christians about the timing of specific events in the future. But there's some things that all Christians agree on. And one of those things that is as plain as day and is crystal clear in this text is that when Jesus comes back among believers, there's going to be the kind of celebration that this world has never seen before. So I don't know if you're premillennial, if you're postmillennial, if you're amillennial, or if you're no millennial. What we all agree on as believers is that when Jesus comes back, 
it's going to be a crazy celebration. And that's what we see in this text. Verse 6, I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, like the sound of many peals of thunder. The Bible doesn't tell us everything about what heaven is going to be like, but one thing that we know for sure is that it is going to be loud. The roar of many waters, the sound of mighty peals of thunder. I've never been to Niagara Falls. Has anybody ever been to Niagara Falls? I've heard about Niagara Falls is that it can, you can actually hear it over 20 miles away. And that when you get close enough, you can't even hear the person that's right in front of you. That's how loud it is. Well, that pales in comparison to what we see here. So why is it so loud? Well, first, it's loud because of how many people are there. Notice verse 6, he says, a great multitude. This is the great multitude that no one could number from every tribe, every language, every people, every nation from texts like Revelation 5.9 and 7.9. This is all the redeemed, all the Old Testament saints, all the Christians in the New Testament, all the Christians in the age of the church, every single person who has trusted in Jesus Christ will be there celebrating. That is why it is loud. That's one reason. The second reason why it's loud is because of who they're celebrating. Hallelujah. It says, highest praise, praise be to God, praise be to Yahweh, the great I am, the Lord, our God, the Almighty. Verse 7, let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. It's loud because we will know then in a way that we don't fully understand now that God deserves all the glory. Now, we believe it now, right? So common Christian phrase, oh, glory to God. All glory be to God. Soli Deo Gloria, right? We believe that. Yet, I think there's a sense in which we don't fully, fully get it. If we fully, fully understood that all the glory belongs to God, that would do something to our pride. That would do something to our holiness and our obedience and our love for Jesus. And yet, if you are a Christian, you do believe it. You do believe that God deserves all the glory. But then, at that time, Christian, you will have glorified eyes. Now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now we know in part, but then we shall know fully, even as we are fully known. Just think about it. When that time comes, we will know better then than we do right now how awful sin is. When that time comes, we will know then better than we do now how unspeakably terrible hell is. When that time comes, we will know then more deeply and more fully than we understand now how much we deserve to be in hell because of our sin against God. In that day, we will know then more than we know now what an incredible thing it was for the Lord Jesus to take on himself human nature. In that day, we will know then more fully than we know now what it meant for Jesus to live a perfect life, completely fulfilling God's law in thought, word, and deed. We will know then more deeply and fully 
then we know now what it meant for Jesus to die on the cross in the place of rebels who do not deserve it. We will know then more fully than we know now what it meant for Jesus to resurrect with all power in his hands and what it meant for Jesus to pour out on his church graciously the gift of the Holy Spirit. We will know then more fully, more richly, more deeply than we understand now how much God has preserved us in this world through many dangers, toils, and snares. We will know then more deeply than we know now what it means that Jesus has been our good shepherd, guiding us all the way, and that God the Father has loved us and cared for us and only been good to us. We will know then more fully and more deeply than we know now that whatever we have suffered for the sake of Christ in this life was absolutely worth it, absolutely worth it. And that understanding, those things that we understand more deeply then, they're going to cause us to lift up our glorified minds, our glorified voices, and glorified affections, and give God all the glory, all the glory. Side note, I do not mind if you say amen. And if you say it loudly, that, might, that won't be discouraging. It might be encouraging. Just to throw that, I'm just going just to put that out there real quick. I come from a context where we, we talk to each other, you know what I'm saying? But it's all good. Amen. Even if you're amening in your heart. When, when, it's, when that day comes, it's not going to be just in your heart. It's, it's going to come out. And you're going to say, hallelujah, glory be to God, the Lord God Almighty. Lord, help us. Let us rejoice, he says in verse 7. Let us rejoice. Let us exult. Let us give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Now, in one sense, this, this picture of the bride that appears here is surprising. So, so what's not surprising is, is the idea of God as husband, because this image of God as husband is found throughout Scripture. So Isaiah 54, verse 5, for your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and the Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer, the God of the whole earth he is called. Isaiah 62, verse 5, as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. So this picture of God as husband is a common picture in the Bible. Also, the image of God's people as bride is also relatively common. However, usually it has a negative connotation to it because it mostly comes in passages where God is rebuking Israel for their idolatry. So God often refers to Israel as an adulteress. Jeremiah 3.20 says, Surely as a treacherous wife leaves her husband, so have you been treacherous to me, O house of Israel, declares the Lord. In fact, there's a whole book, Hosea, dedicated to God illustrating Israel as an unfaithful wife when God commanded Hosea, the prophet, to marry a prostitute. But that's not what we see here in our text today. We see a very different kind of bride here, not an unfaithful bride, not an adulterous bride, but what do we see in verse 7? This bride has made herself ready it was granted to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. This is, this is something different altogether. This is a radiant bride. This is a glorious bride. And so why does God choose this picture of a bride and a husband to describe our union with Christ? Well, I believe it's because 
that picture communicates to us in a way that our finite minds can try to grasp something about the nature of the love that God has for us in Christ. And to dive a little more deeply into that, I want you to turn over, keep a finger in Revelation 19, and turn back to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Classic text, often quoted at weddings. Ephesians 5, and I'll read beginning at verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Now, now this specific applications here in this text for husbands and wives, but what I really want us to notice here is what this text teaches us about the nature of the love of Christ towards his bride, the church. The first thing that we see in verse 25 is that it is an exclusive love. The love that Jesus has for his bride is an exclusive love. Love. Notice verse 25. Husband, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. It's very specific. It's not promiscuous. Jesus does not have wandering eyes. The love that a person has for a spouse should look different from every other kind of love that person has in their lives. And this is what we see with the Lord Jesus, that it is something that is exclusive. It's specific. It's not just indiscriminately shared all over the place, but it has a particular focus. And that focus is the church. He gave himself up for her. Exclusivity. You know, I've been encouraged by many of the things that I've seen with Kanye West and his profession of faith in the Lord Jesus. But one thing that, that struck me is recently there was uh, an episode of <laughs> Keeping Up with the Kardashians, which I promise you I've never watched a day in my life, but it fits this illustration well. There's an episode where his wife is getting ready to go to this event. And the way that she's dressed is just very provocatively. And, and Kanye, they're, they're sitting there, they're having a discussion, and, and he says something to her. He says, you know, I know, and I'm paraphrasing, I, I know that this is what people expect for you to be dressed like this and to be sexy. But then he said, he said, but sexy for who? Because you are my wife. And the, and the thing that he was struggling with was something that he had never struggled with before. He said, listen, I've, I've, I've been in this lifestyle of being a rapper and, and, and looking at all these different women, but, but something's happened to me. There's been a transformation. And, and now I don't, I don't just take pride in my wife looking sexy for any and every other dude to feast his eyes on out there. He said, you are my wife. And so, so, so his desire and what he's communicating there is it's exclusivity. This is how Jesus loves his bride. It's, it's an exclusive relationship. Nobody's intruding on it. 
That's one thing that we see about the love of Christ. When Jesus died on the cross, it wasn't for just this, this faceless, nameless mass of humanity. No, no, if you're trusting in Christ, he had you specifically in mind. It's exclusive. It's specific. The second thing that we learn about the love of Christ in this text is it is a sacrificial love. Look again at verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So Jesus doesn't just say he loves us. He actually does something about it. He lays down his life. And perhaps what's what's most stunning about this reality is that we did nothing to deserve Jesus doing what he has done for us. The Bible is very clear that we all come in to this world as rebels with hearts that are opposed to God. The Bible teaches that we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. God has wired all of us to be worshipers. We we naturally worship, that is, we naturally ascribe glory and honor and praise to things. And so you just think about your favorite artist or your favorite sports team or or your favorite book or your favorite movie, whatever the case may be, it it doesn't take much to get a person talking about the thing that they're most passionate about. But the, the, the horror of sin is that we've taken what rightly should only belong to God and we've given that praise, that worship, and that adoration to everything else but God. And the Bible calls that sin. And because of our sin, if we were to continue in that re- rebellion against God, if God were to leave us in that sinful state, where that would ultimately take us is under the full weight of the wrath of God for all eternity in hell. That's the bad news. But the good news is that God, although he is just, he's absolutely righteous, he's absolutely holy, he must and he will punish sin. He is an avenger of all wrongdoing because it, 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 it smears his own glory. While he is just and righteous and holy, at the same time, he is a God full of love, full of mercy, full of compassion. God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. And what God has done in his kindness is he's done the unthinkable. He sent his son, the Lord Jesus, to come into the world to live the perfect life that none of us could ever live, to die on the cross as a substitute for all who would turn from their sins and place their trust in Jesus Christ, to demonstrate that everything that Jesus ever said was absolutely true through his glorious resurrection three days later. And Jesus is coming back. That's what we see in our text. This, this, this hallelujah, this, this glory that's, 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 that's shaking the heavens, the new heavens and the new earth, this is coming from people who have, who have been redeemed. But there's a flip side to that story. And the flip side is that it's not, so, so, so not everybody is going to be singing hallelujah in the same way. Because there's another group of people that's also talked about over and over in the book of Revelation, and that is those who have not placed their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, those who continue to go on in their rebellion and their sin against God and ultimately died in their sins. And those people, though they will confess and acknowledge that Jesus is Lord, they're singing a completely different song. They're saying, woe is me. They're saying, hide, hide us. Hide us under the rocks. Hide us under the mountains from the wrath of the Lamb. 
And the good news, y'all, is that that doesn't have to be you. You can be saved. You can join with all the redeemed for all eternity in singing God's praises. All you have to do is turn from your sins. Acknowledge, agree with God that, yes, I am a sinner. I have offended him. I haven't done what I'm supposed to, what I'm supposed to do. I haven't thought what I'm supposed to think. I haven't said what I'm supposed to say. What I'm supposed to say. And God has promised if you turn from your sins and place your trust in Jesus, in Jesus alone, you will have the privilege of joining in with the bride of Christ. And you will know Jesus as your husband. You will know his exclusive love. You will know his sacrificial love. Another thing that we see here in this passage is that it is a sanctifying love. It's a sanctifying love. Look at verse 26, that he might sanctify her. That is, to sanctify means to set apart for holy purposes. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. It's a sanctifying love. One thing that that means is that Jesus did not choose people who already had it all together. A- amen. That, that, that is shout worthy. Because if he had to wait for you, To get it all together, you would have never come. You would have never come. Jesus did not make his decision to choose his bride the way that we make our decision to choose our spouse. So what we say is, we say, who's the cutest? We say, who has the best personality? Who's the most intelligent? Who's the most educated? Who's got the best body? Who's the most successful? Who can do the most for me? And then if we're very spiritual, we'll say, who's the most godly? Which, amen, that's what it is. Well, that's absolutely what we should. That, that, <laughs> see, that, that's, that's going to get me on a whole other thing. But let me just say this. When, when it comes to choosing a potential mate, p- p- please make that the most important thing. H- who's the most godly? Because let me tell you something. When you're married and you're in the middle of a conflict at 2 o'clock in the morning, and you haven't gotten sleep because y'all been arguing for the last couple hours, you are not going to be thinking about how cute that person is. (laughs) That's going to be the farthest thing from your mind. But Jesus, Jesus did not say, oh, man, that dude's pretty godly. He's pretty holy. Let me go ahead and die for him. That's not what he said. Hallelujah. No, no, no. Jesus says, the Bible teaches that (laughs) Jesus laid down his life for the ungodly. God justifies the wicked. He he doesn't justify those who have it together. He justifies the wicked. And then in his mercy and in his love, he works on us by his spirit and by his grace. And slowly and painfully, but surely, because he who began a good work, he will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. But in this life, he uses situations, he uses trials, he uses circumstances to by his spirit to sanctify us, to work on us, to mold us, to shape us into the image, to make us look more and more like the Father. He sanctifies us. And then what we see in our passage in Revelation is that the the time comes when that work is perfected and we're glorified and there's no more sin. There's no more being stained with our rebellion towards God. There's no more mixed motives. No more doing things that look right outwardly but have something funny going on inwardly. No, 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 no. When that day comes, 
we will be perfectly, as much as redeemed humanity can be made like the Lord Jesus, we will be like that. It's going to be a, a, a world of Jesus doppelgangers, <laughs> of people that look in character just like the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a sanctifying look. Praise God. Praise God that he doesn't leave us where we are. He takes us where we are. So, so wherever you are right now, if you haven't turned from your sins and trusted in Christ, don't lie to yourself and think, I just got to get myself together before he'll accept me. Don't, that's a lie. That's a lie. G if you trust in Jesus right now, he will take you right now in all of your guilt, in all of your filth, in all of your griminess, in all of your secret sin. If you trust in Christ, Jesus will accept you. But the good news is that he accepts us the way we are, but he doesn't leave us the way we are. He works in us, and he transforms us, and he makes us more and more like him. It's a sanctifying love. Fourth, it's a tender love. It's a tender love. Look at verse 29. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just like Christ does the church. Jesus is gentle in his love toward us. The Lord Jesus in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Praise God that, that Jesus is tender with us. He doesn't, he doesn't just, just, just smash the struggling saint. Any struggling believers in the building? Believers who say, you know what? I'm struggling. Lord Jesus, I believe you, but, but help my unbelief. There, there, there's been sins that I'm, look, I speak for myself. I'm, I'm, I'm 20 years deep into this Christian walk. And I can tell you, I thought 20 years ago, I thought I would be much further along than I am right now. Can anybody relate to that? Struggle, besetting sins, the sin that so easily clings to us. Jesus is tender. He's tender with us. He'll discipline us for sure, but he's tender. He doesn't just smash us. He doesn't just snuff us out. But he works with us, and he guides us, and he leads us into paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He's a good shepherd, and he's tender towards us. And so his love is exclusive. It's sacrificial. It's sanctifying, and it is tender. And so, and we can turn back to Revelation as I uh, bring it in for a landing. We can turn back to Revelation 19. Just, just consider some of the things that happen in a marriage. So in a marriage, traditionally, I would say, the wife takes the name of the husband, right? Now, that's, that's been kind of getting changed in our, right, in, our, in our culture today. But traditionally, the wife took the last name of the husband. And, and, and there's a theological truth embedded in that. What's being communicated there is that there is now a brand new identity. So I came, as I was walking down the aisle, I was Marion Smith. <laughs> but once I get married, I take my husband's name and I'm now Marion Jones. There's been a complete shift in identity. When, 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 you, when, when, when you marry a spouse, what you receive is a brand new relative, in a sense. And this person becomes a, more, a relative who's more close to you than any other relative that you have. There's a priority that happens there. Another thing that happens in marriage is that each spouse takes on the assets of the other spouse. So whatever the husband or the wife brought into the marriage, whatever stuff they have, it becomes, it now belongs to both parties. And so if you have a car, you get married, it's no longer my car, it's our car. You got a house, you get married, it's no longer my house, but it's our house. And one of the things that the world does to try to get around this is they sign prenuptial agreements, right? You know what a prenuptial agreement is? It's, it's saying that, okay, 
if for whatever reason this thing doesn't work out, look, my stuff is going to be my stuff, your stuff is going to be your stuff. That's, that's, there's nothing Christian about that whatsoever. Christian marriage is everything that we bring, everything that I have, all my worldly possessions, they now belong to my wife. And it's funny because when it comes to Christ, you think about this transaction that's taking place of assets. With Christ, it's completely one-sided <laughs> with, with Christ in us, right? So we don't bring any assets to the table in this marriage. Jesus brings all of the assets. The only thing that we bring to the marriage is debt, <laughs> the debt of sin. And that's another thing about marriage, and it's something to think about. Not only their car becomes my car, but their debt, <laughs> their, their six-figure student loan debt <laughs> becomes my debt too. Amen. Amen, somebody. Jesus brings everything to the marriage. Jesus did not marry up. <laughs> he married down, way down. Think about it. We get righteousness. We get eternal life. We get eternal joy. We get eternal peace. We get eternal comfort, eternal security. We get glorified bodies. Jesus gets our sin, our rebellion, our curse. Jesus took the curse, the curse of the law on himself when he died on that cross. And so the only thing prenuptially happening in this arrangement is that Christ, he agreed to lay down his life for his bride. That was part of the prenuptial contract with him and the Father, that he would lay down his life for us. On our end, believe in Jesus. What, what do we have to do to do the works of God? Believe in, in, in God and the one that he has sent. Trust in Christ by faith alone, apart from works of the law. In our text, verse 8, it says, It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Now, the Bible is very clear that we are saved by Christ's righteousness alone. And yet, what do we see here? What's the meaning of this fine linen being the righteous deeds of the saints? Does this mean that uh, in, in some way our, our, the works, the good things that we do as Christians, those things are, are meritorious in a way that saves us? Absolutely not. We're saved by Christ's righteousness. And yet, the Bible also teaches that the righteous deeds that we've done through our faith in Christ will go before us and that God will graciously reward his people for those things. And I think that's what we see here. So in Ephesians 6.6, 6, it's uh, in, in instructions to, to servants. It says, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord. I think that's what's being referred to here. <laughs> so, so, so let's not get it twisted. Nobody in heaven in this scene is going to be looking at their linen on some, yo, look at my linen, yo. Look, look, how, look, how, look how glorious this is right here. I'm, 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 I'm robed in my, in my righteous deeds, all the righteous things that I did on earth. You know what I'm saying? What kind of righteous things did you do? Because I'm looking at your linen. Your linen looking kind of shaky. No. Not at all. We will all give glory to God. If, if you're ever at a wedding, at that moment when, you, when everybody stands up and turns and looks towards the doors and sees the bride coming down the aisle, When's the last time you saw a bride coming down like? The bride has her eyes fixed on the groom. 
The bride's not even thinking about her dress. All that she had to go through to, to pay for the dress, to get fitted for the dress, and, and whatever else goes into getting a, 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 a nice wedding dress, she ain't even thinking about all of that. She's thinking about the groom. Her eyes are on her husband. Her eyes are singularly focused. I like the hymn from Samuel Rutherford, uh, The Sands of Time Are Sinking, based on Samuel Rutherford's le- letters. It says, the bride eyes not her garments, but her dear bridegroom's face. I will not gaze at glory, but on my king of grace. Not at the crown he giveth, but on his pierced hand. The lamb is all the glory in Emmanuel's land. All eyes on the groom. Verse 9, the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. This is one wedding that you do not want to miss out on. Blessed are those who are invited to this wedding. And so what a, what a perfect bookend to the story of redemption. In Genesis 1 and 2, we have creation, the, new, the, the, the first heaven, heaven and earth. God, in Genesis 1 1, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. We have creation that culminates with a wedding when God made Eve from Adam and presented his wife to him, and the two became one flesh. Perfect bookend. Because here in Revelation, we see the new creation culminating in a wedding where the church is presented to the second Adam in splendor, without spot, without wrinkle, or any such thing. And so, as you think about what it means to to go and to live for Christ in your schools, in your clubs, on your athletic teams, whatever the case may be, Go knowing that you are accepted by God. If you're trusting in Christ, you're accepted by God, not because of what you've done, but because of what he's done for you in Christ. And know that nothing can ever separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus, because in his mercy and in his kindness, he has made you his bride. Amen? Let's pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is astounding. It's wild. (laughs) It is wild that you have loved us with the same love that you have for your very son, the Lord Jesus. And Lord, we know that it's only because We've been united with Christ by faith. And so I pray for anyone here who may not have trusted in you yet, that even as we sing uh, these last songs, that you would be at work by your spirit to convince them of the reality and the truthfulness of these things. And Lord, let us, as we sing praises to you, let us sing passionately. Let us sing joyfully. Let us sing gratefully because you have done a great thing in making us your bride. Help us. We need you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.